I'd like to introduce you to my co-speaker today, Dr. Edgar Milford, um, who's an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a senior physician in the renal division and uh, the director of our HLA tissue typing lab. So we have no financial disclosures. Thank you. Um, We have a pointer or no? I think we can just use the mouse. Okay. Um, so the other thing is there aren't any audience response um, clickers here. So what we'll do is we'll just do this by show of hands. Welcome to all of you. This is a uh, an interesting session. Um, a lot of the uh, problems in kidney transplantation are really internal medicine. Uh, and uh, but there are a few little points that you should know about things that happen in the peritransplant and post-transplant period. Uh, the first case is a, a man um, uh, with diabetic nephropathy and had a deceased donor uh, kidney transplant uh, half a year ago, comes to the clinic. Um, the patient had inductive therapy with <clears throat> Uh, antithymocyte globulin, followed by uh, tacrolimus, uh, or FK506, mycophenolate, and prednisone. And the post-transplant course uh, included cellular rejection uh, two months after transplant, which was treated with a, a course of uh, ATG again, plus high-dose steroids. Uh, the function stabilized uh, at a creatinine of 1.5, and he feels well, but the creatinine was elevated to uh, 2. Uh, the complete blood count was normal. The trough uh, uh, tacro level was 8, and the PCR for the BK polyoma virus is positive for the first time at 80,000 copies per ml. Uh, and then well, the question is, which one is most correct regarding management? Uh, and you might want to raise your hands if you think uh, uh, so, or you can just shout out. I'll, I'll read them. Start another course of ATG and high-dose steroid for suspected acute rejection. Allograft biopsy followed by decrease in immunosuppression if there is no evidence of acute uh, rejection. Uh, start IV sidofavir, switch from tacrolimus to serolimus, uh, or addition of uh, leflunamide. Um, how many people think it's A? Nobody thinks it's A. How many people think it's B? C? D? And E? Well, I think they, they probably cheated. Um, so with positive BK load, you need to consider the possibility of BK nephropathy as the cause of the elevated serum creatinine. Um, but definitive diagnosis really does require a renal allograft biopsy. Um, and uh, acute rejection occurs along with <clears throat> BK about 50% of the time, and histologic features are quite similar. Um, the um, inclusion bodies are important in terms of diagnosing BK and um, uh, positive staining for SV40, the special stain. Um, and there really isn't any good evidence for a treatment strategy, although they have been proposed and tried. Uh, so the only uh, treatment strategy which has been proven effective is to reduce the immunosuppressive therapy. We have a 45-year-old uh, man who had polycystic kidney disease, and this is the second uh, transplant the first transplant failed because of chronic rejection and comes in for a uh, routine visit. Good, stable creatinine. Last uh, 
routine lab uh, had a creatinine which was still 1.2. Tacrolimus level was 10. Uh, CBC was normal. He had had uh, an EGD because he had a dinophagia and was diagnosed with candid esophagitis, so he was treated with fluconazole. Um, today he reports that his dinophagia has resolved and um, feels well. Takes tacro and mycophenolate for maintenance. Standard lab tests include uh, CBC that's normal, creatinine is elevated to 1.6. Um, which one of the following is correct? Start pulse steroids, since he is at high immunologic risk for acute rejection. Wait for the tacro level to come back since fluconazole can significantly increase tacrolimus metabolism. Wait for tacro level to come back since fluconazole can significantly decrease uh, tacrolimus metabolism. Switch uh, from tacro to cyclosporin since uh, cyclosporin doesn't have an interaction. Uh, arrange for urgent biopsy to rule out rejection uh, or CNI-induced thrombotic microangiopathy. A, B, so a few people say B. C, a lot of people say C. This is a trick, you know? This is a trick question. Look at the wording. Uh, So increasing tacrolimus metabolism means you would have a decreased level. Decreasing tacrolimus metabolism means you'd have an increased level, okay? So that, that's the, it's kind of a tricky business. Uh, switch tacro to cyclosporin. Arrange for urgent biopsy. Nobody, okay. So both cyclosporin and tacrolimus are metabolized by cytochrome P450 uh, in GI and in liver. And a number of antifungal agents uh, listed there can markedly increase CNI levels uh, because they inhibit the uh, cytochrome uh, 3A, B, C, D. Therefore, you have to take great care when uh, starting and stopping these antifungal. Uh, you know, we've seen levels go up uh, threefold uh, on, with uh, ketoconazole, for example. One should consider possibility of acute rejection. Preemptive anti-rejection treatment or biopsy would be premature since a markedly elevated tacro level would explain the rise in serum creatinine. So not knowing you know, what the tacro level is, uh, it may be very, very high. And both uh, of these calcineurin inhibitors have been associated with development of TMA. Uh, the usual extrarenal manifestations may not be present because the condition can be limited to the allograph with no decrease in platelet count, schistocytes, or elevation in LDH level. Any questions or comments about that? Yes. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I, We will often uh, decrease the tacro dose, but then we follow it up by a, uh, a level, of course, to prevent this kind of uh, situation from happening. Uh, this is a 52-year-old uh, woman with ESRD from uh, diabetic nephropathy. She uh, had a living-related transplant uh, just, uh, uh, you know, about four months ago, and uh, the CMV was donor recipient positive, both. EBV was negative for both donor and recipient. And she got uh, ATG followed by tacro and mycophenolate and prednisone. She came in with diarrhea, nausea, and bloating. Her um, <coughs> blood pressure is 118 over 70, and uh, heart rate was okay. She was afebrile. Uh, really, her physical exam was normal. 
or uh, hemoglobin uh, was eight, white count was uh, low at 1,400, and platelets were 90,000. Uh, the allograft function was actually quite stable, and TACRA level was eight. Um, and uh, that was, that's pretty much within the range of what we uh, aim for early after kidney transplantation. Uh, she takes uh, TACRO 3 BID, MMF 1 gram BID, and prednisone 5 a day. Prophylaxis includes valcite and uh, clotrimazole, uh, trimoxazole, single strength. Which of the following is correct? One, decrease the MMF dose and send serum CMV PCR. Decrease tacrolimus dose and send serum CMV PCR. Continue the MMF at the current dose, and since diarrhea and nausea are rare side effects of MMF. Stop valcite since she has leukopenia and is at low risk for CMV infection. Increase valcite uh, to start empiric treatment um, for CMV disease. So, excuse me? Nobody said A. Nobody raised their hand, so you all got it wrong. You got zero. You're fired. Um, what is this? Uh, next? Uh, here we go. Okay. So it's A. Um, the most common effect of MMF are related to the GI tract, uh, as you all know. Uh, nausea, vomiting, sometimes uh, diarrhea, abdominal pain, bloating. Uh, and it occurs in up to one-third of patients, depending on the dose and the, uh, as well as uh, how often during the day you take it. So sometimes you can um, modulate the symptoms by just uh, giving the same total dose, but distributing it the day uh, uh, or changing the formulation. Uh, and uh, the uh, symptoms respond to reduction of drug dose or splitting the total daily dose. GI side effects of the enteric coated formulation uh, is not significantly different from the original, but um, it has improved patient symptoms. We often see that giving the enteric coated does improve the symptoms of uh, GI upset in these patients. And of course, MMF can cause leukopenia, anemia, and thromb thrombocytopenia, uh, which usually responds to reduction in the dose. Um, leukopenia alone is a rare side effect of tacrolimus. It does happen, but it's rare. Uh, and valcite can cause leukopenia, uh, but stopping it would be a bit premature uh, because she's at risk uh, for a CMV. Now, it is not um, a high-risk CMV. High-risk would be if the donor was positive, but the recipient is negative. Intermediate risk uh, of recurrence of CMV would be if the donor and recipient are positive. Uh, the highest risk are obviously donor positive, recipient negative. Um, but one can get reactivation of latent CMV as well as reinfection with a new viral strain in CMV positive positive patients. And CMV infection can also cause leukopenia but starting empiric treatment before confirming the viremia is premature since uh, she has been on uh, prophylaxis. Um, and the other issue is that uh, uh, when wants to know whether or not there's a resistant form of CMV, obviously, uh, if the person's on prophylaxis and still has CMV, one would want to know whether or not the strain is uh, is. Uh, one that is uh, not responding to the prophylaxis. Any questions about that?
Here's a woman who comes to the clinic complaining of fatigue, weight loss, abdominal pain. She had a deceased donor transplant back in 2008, uh, which was from focal sclerosing, uh, 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 focal uh, sclerosis. Her graft function is stable with a serum creatinine of 1.3 on tacrolimus, MMF, and prednisone. Uh, the MRI revealed a circumferential mass uh, which uh, was uh, circling the jejunal loop uh, without evidence of obstruction. Which one of the following statements is correct regarding PTLD, uh, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease after kidney transplantation? One, zero negative, EBV zero negative status of the recipient at the time of transplant, zero negative status, and induction with T cell depleting antibodies have been associated with increased risk for the development of PTLD. Two people, three people. B, PTLD only occurs in the first year after transplantation when patients are most immunosuppressed. And while the majority of cases are not caused by EBV, EBV associated PTLD does occur. Rituxan is not an effective treatment option since most PTLD is of T cell origin. Treatment includes increase in basal immunosuppression. That's ridiculous. So the principal risk factors uh, are EBV serostatus of the recipient and the degree of T cell immunosuppression. I mean, those are the principal risk factors. Uh, so that's the most uh, likely answer. Uh, while the incidence of PTLD is highest in the first year uh, after transplantation, the time most immunosuppression cumulative incidence over uh, five years uh, ranges from one to three percent. And most cases are uh, induced by EBV infection. Um, however, EBV negative disease does occur. It does occur. Uh, and uh, most of these are non-Hodgkin's lymphoma of B cell origin and are CD20 positive. Therefore, uh, the use of uh, rituxan is uh, one uh, part of the therapy. Restoration of host immunity is the most important therapy for the control of uh, lymphoproliferative disease. And indeed, in the early days, uh, there were a number of patients who responded uh, to uh, this kind of a syndrome simply by uh, decreasing the immunosuppression or stopping it, and they would uh, resolve their uh, lymphoproliferative disease. Therapeutic options include reduction of basal immunosuppression, rituxan, in the case of CD20 positive lymphomas, and uh, CHOP alone or in combination with rituxan, depending on what the pathology shows and how aggressive the lesion is. Questions about that? And this is a man with uh, P. Uh, polycystic uh, kidney disease uh, and comes to the clinic uh, after a living related transplant um, almost a year after uh, living related transplant but the donor uh, was both EBV and CMV positive the recipient was negative for both EBV and CMV by that it's meant that there's uh, no antibody in the recipient, by the way. There's no antibody evidence of having had been exposed to either EBV or CMV, whereas with the donor, uh, they had both CMV and EBV. The course was complicated by acute cellular rejection, uh, and that was treated with ATG and high-dose steroids, and he comes in with fever, chills, malaise for a week. Uh, blood pressure's okay, heart rate's elevated, Fever is up to 103. Physical exam really is unremarkable. The white count was 1,200. And uh, platelets were 95. 
creatinine was 1.4, uh, which was pretty much baseline, and TACRO level was 7. The AST and ALT were 150 and 188, which was more than three times the uh, normal in the lab. And the urinalysis was unremarkable, and chest X-ray is not yet uh, red. <coughs> Maintenance immunosuppression includes tacrolimus, cell sept, and prednisone, and he's on uh, Bactrim prophylaxis. Which of the following is correct? One, arrange for a renal allograft biopsy to rule out PK nephropathy. Two, send serum PK polyomavirus PCR and start IV sidofavir while waiting for the result. See, CMV disease is unlikely since the patient is CMV seronegative and therefore at low risk. PTLD is unlikely since the patient is EBV seronegative and therefore at low risk. The initial workup should include serum CMV PCR. Okay. These are too easy. These are too easy. We need to, but this is the kind of question you're going to get. The fact of the matter is that you're not going to get really tough questions on the board. Uh, bread and butter stuff. Uh, and so the initial workup should include serum PCR. And obviously the patients that highest risk for CMV are people who are CMV negative uh, uh, with a positive donor. Uh, he received anti-rejection treatment, high dose steroids, putting him at further risk for CMV disease. So the patient is at risk. Um, the serum CMV PCR is the test of choice to diagnose CMV viremia and disease and to monitor the response to antiviral therapy. Uh, usually, uh, with antiviral therapy, the PCR becomes actually negative. Uh, among likely, uh, among kidney transplant patients, BK causes a tubular interstitial in the fritis, uh, and usually they're asymptomatic or slowly progressive rise in creatinine, uh, rarely ureteral stenosis, and uh, Systemic the, uh, symptoms are really uncommon. It's usually asymptomatic. There's an increased risk of PTLD among EBV negative recipients of EBV positive donors. And also, the anti rejection therapy they received recently puts them at higher risk for PTLD. All right, so the next question is a 40 year old. 48-year-old African-American who has end-stage renal disease from lupus, um, who underwent a second uh, transplant, which was a deceased donor renal transplant about three weeks ago. CMV serostatus is donor positive, recipient positive. EBV uh, serostatus was donor positive, recipient negative. So her first transplant had failed due to chronic antibody-mediated rejection. And her current course um, has been complicated by delayed graft function and the need for intermittent hemodialysis. So she was biopsied on post-op day seven, and that biopsy showed severe ATN. Um, and now by post-op day 21, she remains oliguric and dialysis dependent. And so we decided to perform a repeat graft biopsy. And that showed ongoing ATN and neutrophils in the peritubular capillaries. C4D staining is now diffusely positive in the PTC, and ultrasound during the biopsy uh, was pretty unremarkable. Uh, she takes tacrolimus and MMF for her maintenance and immunosuppression. So which one of the following statements is most correct regarding her case? A, findings of the second biopsy are consistent with the recovery phase of ATN. We should just continue her current management and repeat another graft biopsy in seven days if there's still no further improvement. B, uh, let's check for donor-specific anti-HLA antibody and arrange for plasmapheresis and IVIG. C, start treatment for T-cell mediated rejection for ATG, or sorry, with uh, ATG and pulse steroids. D, send serum BK PCR and decrease her MMF dose or E, switch to chrolimus to bilatisept since the calcineurin inhibitor is delaying recovery from ATN. 
So who votes for A? B? C? D? And E? All right, definitely need to make these questions harder next year. <laughs> so as you guys correctly identified, um, the histological appearance of acute ABMR may actually appear as ATN, um, but you also see neutrophil margination and infiltration in the glomerular capillaries and, and particularly in the peritubular capillaries. Um, you can also see evidence of thrombotic microangiopathy, fibrinoid necrosis. Um, if the ABMR uh, is diagnosed early, sometimes all you see is significant endothelial cell um, dis swelling and dysfunction. Um, you should always, the pathologist should always stain for uh, C4D, which as you all know is a evidence of a complement uh, pathway um, activation, and so it's evidence that there's antibody-mediated uh, complement cytotox, uh, complement activation. Um, and of course, it's useful to repeat the cross-match if possible, if you have donor cells, um, and to measure um, donor-specific antibody. Um, of course, you know, the issues with the thymoglobulin and pulse steroids is that's the treatment for uh, acute cellular rejection and thus not appropriate. Um, switching from tacrolimus to bilatacept would not help. Um, and also, the one note is that because the recipient was seronegative for EBV, bilatacept is actually contraindicated in this patient um, since it, uh, the risk of PTLD is particularly increased in, in, these, in these patients. Uh, so the next question, we have a 58-year-old uh, African-American gentleman with end-stage renal disease from reflux nephropathy. Um, he got a deceased donor renal transplant about four years ago and was found to have biopsy-proven ABMR, antibody-mediated rejection, one year post-transplant. And that was treated with uh, five sessions of phoresis and IVIG. And since then, he's been maintained on Tacro, MMF, and prednisone for maintenance. And um, over the last year, the patient's serum creatinine has been gradually rising from 1.5 to 3. And so a biopsy was done. And this revealed glomerular capillary wall thickening with a double contour appearance. Um, there was evidence of arterial intimal fibrosis with intimal mononuclear cell infiltration, as well as some interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. The C4D staining in the peritubular capillaries was positive. So which one of the following statements is most correct regarding his biopsy findings? A, the presence of anti-HLA donor-specific antibody has been associated with chronic ABMR. B, the absence of anti-HLA antibodies rules out the diagnosis of ABMR. C, since the introduction of more potent immunosuppressants, chronic ABMR has become a rare cause for chronic allograft failure. D, it usually responds well to treatment with phoresis, IVIG, and pulse steroids. And, or E, it usually responds well to treatment with rituximab. So, so polls for A, B, C, D, E, all right, great job, must be because you're fed. So the presence of anti-HLA donor specific antibody of course is associated with chronic ABMR and um, regardless of uh, uh, whether or not it, it, it causes acute episodes of ABMR, you can sort of have subclinical um, antibody-mediated rejection that occurs. And this is particularly true with the class two antigens. Um, and when we think about that, we usually think of um, DR um, being the most important. But as I mentioned, there's some thought that perhaps um, DQ um, alloantibody uh, may also play a role. Um, Non-HLA antibodies, um, such as the MYC-A, antivimentin, um, you know, uh, other, other anti-endothelial antibodies, um, have also been implicated as potential causes of, of ABMR. Um, and uh, despite current immunosuppression, um, there's a high percentage of chronic allograft loss that, that remains due to chronic ABMR. 
And in fact, um, there are some studies that suggest that up to 60% of patients with chronic allograft failure show some evidence of antibody-mediated injury. Um, treatment of chronic ABMR, as you all know, is, is quite problematic um, and frustrating for those of us who deal with it on a clinical uh, basis. Um, treatment protocols that we typically use for acute episodes of antibody-mediated rejection, things like pharesis, IVIG, rituximab, uh, bortezomib, um, really don't seem to alter the course of chronic ABMR um, very, very much. All right, so the next question, 52-year-old uh, African-American with end-stage renal disease from lupus. Um, she underwent a deceased donor renal transplant four months ago. Uh, she received induction with bezaliximab, followed by maintenance therapy with tacro MMF and prednisone. She's been doing overall since then, and her creatinine is stable at 1.1. Um, on a routine follow-up uh, uh, visit, her creatinine was found to be elevated now at 1.8 milligrams per deciliter. <laughs> Tacro level was roughly the same at around 5, and a bedside ultrasound uh, showed a kidney allograft size of 10.2 centimeters and no evidence of hydra. So she underwent a biopsy, which showed prominent interstitial inflammation and moderate tu focal tubulitis, mild to moderate intimal arteritis, and negative staining for C4D. So which of the following statements is most correct? A, the patient has acute ABMR, and a treatment with pharesis, IVIG, and pulse steroids should be initiated. B, the patient has acute T-cell mediated rejection, and we should treat with bilatacept and pulse steroids. C, the patient has acute T-cell mediated rejection, and we should treat with um, ATG and pulse steroids. Or D, BK nephropathy is ruled out since the patient has an acute rejection. Anybody else for anything else? All right. So yes, so the key is to identify the pathological features of T-cell mediated re rejection. Um, so this is uh, based on the BAMF criteria, which defines um, and classifies T-cell mediated re rejection depending on the presence and extent of tubulitis, that's the T-score, interstitial inflammation, your I-score, and arteritis, um, or your V-score. Um, the presence of endoarteritis is automatically classified as t type 2 T-cell mediated rejection, and in this case, um, for Depending on your center, but most centers, if you're uh, at least 2A or above, or maybe bad 1B, um, will tend to treat with a T cell depleting agent such as, as thymoglobulin in conjunction with steroids. Now, bilatacept uh, is not appropriate um, for treatment of acute rejection. And um, the thing to note, too, um, is that BK nephropathy and, and acute cellular rejection can actually go hand in hand. And the difficulty here is that they can actually occur concurrently and have similar histological features um, with the tubulitis and the interstitial inflammation. The thing to, to ask your pathologists about if you're really worried about BK nephropathy is for them to look for inclusion bodies, um, viral inclusions, um, and you know where they really want to be looking for that is at the junction at the corticomedullary border is where it first starts. Um, and they can also do in situ hybridization looking for SV40 staining. And so BK nephropathy, SV40 staining would be, would be positive. But as I mentioned, sometimes those two can occur uh, together. And when that happens, sometimes what we do is if the extent of the inflammation is, is, is uh, significant and we cannot make the distinction, we give a short course of pulse steroids and then in the long term, lower the maintenance immunosuppression. Questions about that? Uh, so the next question is a 69-year-old gentleman um, who had end-stage renal disease from diabetic nephropathy. He's been on dialysis for one year and uh, then received a kidney from a 61-year-old deceased donor with a cold ischemic time of 28 hours. He remained oliguric after transplant and was dialyzed on post-up day two for hyperkalemia and volume overload. 
uh, biopsy was performed on post-op day 10, and that revealed uh, diffuse tubular injury, and it was negative for C4D. He had received basiliximab for induction and is currently being treated with tacro, MMF, and prednisone. He presents for routine follow-up three weeks after. His <laughs> urine output is only about 300 cc's in the last 24 hours, and he's been um, dialysis dependent over the course of this time, requiring dialysis three times a week. Blood pressure is 140 over 90, heart rate of 90, he's afebrile. It's bilateral, moderate, lower extremity edema, but otherwise the rest of his exam is unremarkable. Uh, his CBC is normal, his serum creatinine is 8.4, and his tacro level is 8. Which one of the following statements is most correct regarding delayed graft function and its prevention? A, the most common cause of DGF is acute rejection. B, risk for DGF is nearly the same for kidneys procured from do donors after cardiac death. C, the patient's risk factors for DGF include cold ischemic time and calcineurin inhibitor therapy. D, compared with storage in cold solution, machine perfusion has never been shown to reduce the risk of DGF. Or E, while DGF greatly impacts one-year graft survival, it has no impact on long-term graft function or patient survival. So I hear some quieter whispers. All right, okay. <laughs> Anybody else think it's anything else? All right. Yep, so the main risk factors for this patient is for de uh, delayed graft function and ongoing de delayed graft function is the, is the cold ischemic time and the, and the CNI therapy. Now, obviously, the incidence of GGF increases with higher donor age, um, donor vascular disease like donor hypertension or even donor hypotension um, at the time of, of um, uh, during the um, peri-expiration period, um, a cold ischemic time exceeding 24 hours, um, and of course, if you initiate CNI therapy. Um, the leading cause of DGF, as you all know, is ATN, re uh, related to ischemia reperfusion um, and organ procurement. And the incidence of DGF um, is approximately 5% for uh, live donor kidneys, 30% for the uh, standard criteria donor kidneys, here I'm going to give it to you in terms of the expanded criteria donor kidneys, and that, that number is about 50%. I know that, that the new kidney allocation system has moved towards uh, the KDPI as a ri risk index of, of donor kidneys, but we still yet have, ha we need to wait a few years in order for us to get information about um, rates of DGF using that, that new categorization. And then, but if you sort of think about it in terms of, of um, your patient, and I think you can sort of get a sense of, of how often you would expect to have DGF. And of course, with donor cardiac death, um, which was the case here, up to 70% of recipients will, will have D, uh, DGF, DGF requiring dialysis, that is. Uh, machine perfusion, so putting the kidney on a pump does reduce the risk of DGF and graft failure. Um, and of course, both graft and patient survival rates are affected um, by the development of DGF. Um, so a 50-year-old woman um, with end-stage renal disease from PKD um, is on maintenance dialysis, and she's referred to you for evaluation of kidney transplant. So her medical history includes hypertension and dyslipidemia, um, and she's heard that kidney transplantation can cause diabetes, worsen dyslipidemia, and because of this, she's, she's worried and, and wants more information about this. She's really interested in kidney transplant, but is concerned about the impact it may have on our long-term health. So which one of the following statements is most correct regarding cardiovascular disease and kidney transplant? A, the annual rate of fatal or non-fatal cardiovascular disease events in kidney transplant recipients is nearly similar to the general population. B, kidney transplantation is known to reduce mortality compared to dialysis, despite significant increases in cardiovascular risk after transplant. C, CMV seronegativity has been associated with increased risk of cardiovascular death in transplant recipients. D, new onset diabetes mellitus after transplantation, otherwise known as NODAT, may occur as a result of insulin resistance, increased insulin metabolism, and or diminished insulin secretion. 
or E, hyperlipidemia and hyperglycemia are, mar are less marked with cyclosporin than with tacrolimus. E, okay, let's do hands because I think I hear some differences. A, B, C, D, E. All right, so it looks like it's between B and D. All right, so the correct answer is D. So new, no DAT um, may occur as a result of um, insulin uh, resistance. This is often due to um, uh, weight gain that patients have after, after transplant, um, steroid use, or sirolimus. Um, there's increased insulin metabolism because you have restoration of kidney insulin metabolism. Um, and there's also a degree of insulin, uh, diminished insulin secretion um, because of uh, direct pancreatic beta cell toxicity if a person's on a calcineurin inhibitor, specifically tacrolimus, okay? Um, the reason why B was incorrect is that um, the reduced mortality after kidney transplant compared to dialysis it, is probably largely due to the reduction in cardiovascular risk associated with the improved kidney function that a successful transplant provides. Okay. And then, of course, um, C is not true whatsoever. And in terms of hyperlipidemia, it's less marked with tacrolimus. Um, so sometimes if my patients have hypertriglyceridemia or total cholesterol levels that are very high and they're on cyclosporin, I'll make the switch over to tacrolimus and that helps. Um, uh, but hyperglycemia, because of the beta cell uh, toxicity, is actually worse with the TACRA. <coughs> You're supposed to use the mic, sir. We have a 27-year-old woman who had FSGS as the cause of her ESRD and was started on maintenance hemodialysis referred to you for pre-transplant eval. She wants to know about possibility of pregnancy after transplantation, which is correct. Pregnancy rate after kidney transplantation is nearly similar uh, to that of the general population. Two. Uh, she can attempt to become pregnant as soon as her serum creatinine starts to decline since her risk of graft dysfunction will be low. Pregnancy has a significant unfavorable effect on long-term graft function regardless of the baseline allograft function. Mycophenolate is associated with an increased risk of congenital malformations and therefore it is absolutely contraindicated during pregnancy. And the use of cyclosporin in pregnancy increases the incidence of hypertension, and therefore it is absolutely contraindicated during pregnancy. Which one? Yeah, okay. So, mycophenolate is associated with an increased risk of congenital fetal abnormalities, uh, and this is true both in animals and in uh, people and therefore is uh, contraindicated in pregnancy. Um, the FDA actually mandates that all female patients of childbearing uh, potential acknowledge that they've been informed about the risks of mycophenolate during pregnancy. Um, and fertility is usually improved within a few months after kidney transplant. Pregnancy rate remains, however, significantly lower after kidney transplantation compared to the general population. Um, and it's recommended to wait about a year after transplant becoming pregnant and only attempt to become pregnant when allograft function is stable uh, with uh, no or minimal proteinuria. 90% incidence of successful pregnancies has been reported for women with uh, baseline serum creatinine of 1.5 milligrams per deciliter or less, but all those patients should be seen by high-risk uh, OB anyway. And um, most studies suggest that pregnancy does not have an unfavorable effect on long-term graft function uh, as long as it's uh, excellent. Cyclosporin has the potential to cause 
uh, or exacerbate maternal hypertension, it doesn't look like it is a major teratogen and is not absolutely contraindicated. Uh, intrauterine growth retardation, small for gestational age. Neonates have been reported with cyclosporin use and may reflect chronic vasoconstriction. Which is true about, or most correct rather, about side effects of maintenance immunosuppressants? Both calcineurin inhibitors can cause hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. Hirsutism and gum hypertrophy are more common with tacrolimus than with cyclosporin. Hypertension and hyperuricemia are more common with tacrolimus than with cyclosporin. Sirolimus is associated with de novo proteinuria as well as exaggeration of pre-existing proteinuria. Since the induction of the enteric-coated formulation of mycophenolic acid, GI side effects are very rare. So, you know, although the uh, introduction of the enteric coated decreases the incidence of side effects, you still see quite a bit of GI upset leading to either having to reduce the dose of mycophenolic acid enteric coated or changing it to another uh, formulation. Quite a bit of GI side effect with both formulations. Um, the de novo proteinuria, however, even nephrotic syndrome and exaggeration of pre-existing proteinuria um, are quite common with mTOR inhibitors, including serolimus and everolimus. Uh, so quantitative monitoring of urinary protein is recommended while on these drugs. Um, and uh, administration of the mTOR inhibitors in people who are proteinuric uh, should be avoided if, if uh, possible. Cyclosporin and tacrolimus can cause hyperkalemia and hypomagnesemia. So hyperkalemia, hypomagnesemia. Cyclosporin is associated with hirsutism, uh, while tacrolimus uh, is more associated with alopecia. And cyclosporin, of course, causes the gum hypertrophy. Um, and hypertension, hyperuricemia, and hyperlipidemia are more common with uh, Cyclosporin, while hyperglycemia neurotoxicity is more common with tacro. Uh, GI side effect profile of the enteric coated formulation is not significantly different from the original MMF, um, and, uh, but in individual patients, one can sometimes see a, an improvement in symptoms. This is a middle aged uh, patient with ESRD now has a third kidney transplant from an older donor after cardiac death. Cold ischemia time is elevated at 30 hours. And the transplant um, is placed in the fossa where a failed transplant had been removed. Good initial function, and the creatinine fell from 4.9 to 2.1 on the second day. Uh, but the urine output fell to 400 uh, milliliters per day by postoperative day five. That's a little unusual. Usually patients are fluid overloaded and they're making lots of urine um, uh, on postoperative day five when they're still diuresing and getting rid of the excess fluid. A modest size perinephric collection is seen by ultrasound at that time. There's good blood flow to the transplant kidney, no hydronephrosis. And the biopsy showed 20% glomerulosclerosis and moderate vascular disease. Um, trough tacrolimus was nine, uh, which is about what, you know, in the, within the range of what we expect early after transplant. One week later, the patient remains oliguric. The BUN is 30 and the creatinine is 12.5. Repeat ultrasound shows a similar sized collection, and repeat biopsy findings are the same as the prior biopsy. TACRO level is five. What would be the best course of action in this situation of severe renal 
failure, um, a perinephric collection, um, and allograft biopsy showing a lot of glomerulosclerosis in moderate vascular disease. Switch the tacrolimus to rapamycin because calcineurin related renal vasoconstriction is the cause of his allograft dysfunction. Decrease the tacrolimus dose further and repeat a biopsy in another week if there's no improvement in allograft function. Continue the current management. The patient likely has ATN from the prolonged cold ischemia time and allograft function will likely improve over the next week. Sample the perinephric fluid to rule out a urinoma and do a nuclear scan. Continue current management. The patient has no pain and the collection likely represents a lymphocele. What do you guys think? Right. So it's all well and good to make some assumptions about what could be the problem, but with a perinephric fluid uh, collection and this kind of um, de novo increase in the serum creatinine with a, a tacrolimus level, which actually uh, has uh, fallen from 9 to 5, uh, it's unlikely that this is uh, simple tacrotoxicity. Um, so it's easy to rule out a urinary leak. Urinary leaks can um, not just cause obstruction, in which, uh, but that was not the case here because there was no hydronephrosis. But also, uh, the urine that is leaking can be reabsorbed, uh, and therefore, um, essentially, uh, the patient has no output of, uh, of toxins. So the serum creatinine is disproportionately high, reflecting reabsorption of urine uh, by the peritoneum. Sometimes uh, these urinomas uh, can actually have be tracked into the peritoneal space and reabsorbed in intraperitoneally, but uh, they can also just be the perinephric uh, urinoma, which is reabsorbed. Uh, and that's why a nuclear scan is helpful uh, because it can demonstrate function of the transplant kidney as well as extravasation into the perinephric space. So this is one case uh, in which a scan is, can be helpful. Um, the uh, vascular disease in the allograft uh, does raise the possibility of vascular compromise, um, including vessels supplying the ureter. Uh, and that is a risk for distal ureteric necrosis at the ureterovesical junction in a urine leak. It's less likely that tacrolimus toxicity would explain the graft function uh, because the, there was a reduction in the level of, uh, and the dosage of the tacro without any effect. And ATN is less likely given the absence of tubular injury on the biopsy, both biopsies. Um, it is possible that the fluid collection represents a lymphocele, but unlikely to cause such significant graft dysfunction unless it was causing hydronephrosis by a compression uh, of the allograft. So the sampling of the perinephric fluid and measuring creatinine levels from the fluid would allow you to distinguish between lymphocele and the urinoma. And uh, urinomas, of course, would have markedly elevated levels of creatinine. And absence of pain doesn't rule a urinoma out. This is a man with uh, ESRD from primary idiopathic F SGS. Uh, six weeks ago, transplanted, uh, had received inductive ATG and uh, sirolimus and mycophenolate and prednisone as uh, therapy, maintenance therapy. The allograft function has been stable with a good creatinine and he has noticed a worsening uh, lower extremity edema, however. The blood pressure is good. Physical exam is normal except for the pitting edema of the lateral, of both of the uh, extremities, not unilateral. And laboratory tests show serum creatinine at 1.6 now and a spot urine to protein creatinine uh, ratio of 8. Uh, CBC is normal. Serolimus trough level is 7. Which of the following is most correct? 
Predictors for recurrence of SSGS include rapid progression of initial disease to ESRD and adult onset of disease. B, um, this is unlikely recurrent FSGS since the patient is currently treated with mycophenolic acid and steroids. Use of mTOR inhibitors have been shown to cause FSGS. This is unlikely recurrent FSGS since recurrence of primary FSGS is very rare. Ha. Huh. Is that really? Did you put? Where is? Oh. oh. Recurrence of uh, recurrence of primary FSGS is unlikely to occur so quickly post transplant. Which one? Everybody said A? Adult onset of disease? It's a, you know, these trick questions are, uh, Annoying sometimes, but so, but it is true that sirolimus, and I told you this before, I already told you this. Sirolimus is associated with the development of proteinuria and FSGS. Um, and in one study, uh, uh, people converted to sirolimus, 64% uh, developed proteinuria, and 30% uh, were actually found to have FSGS. So it, uh, it's, you have to really monitor patients who are on sirolimus for proteinuria as well as FSGS. And it's also associated with the actual collapsing form of FSGS. Um, and about 30% uh, of people uh, uh, have resolution if you stop it. Um, so the major risk factors for recurrence of FSGS include childhood at onset, rapid progression of initial disease. That is true. That is true white race, and history of recurrence in a prior allograft. And there's no association between maintenance immunosuppressive regimen and the risk of recurrent glomerular disease after transplant. And risk for recurrent primary FSGS uh, vary uh, from 30 to 50 percent. It can recur virtually immediately after transplantation and is likely due to a circulating permeability factor. We've seen patients who, uh, in the first uh, urine taken after transplant in the recovery room have had nephrotic range proteinuria uh, due to recurrence of FSGS. So it's an, a, it can be an instantaneous uh, thing. Uh, but uh, this is a situation where mTOR is contributing. <laughs>